warm welcome to, to all of you. My name is Sam Dawes. I'm the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the UK. And we'd like to express our gratitude to the Foreign Office for hosting tonight's proceedings. When the Young Professionals Network was established just 26 months ago, uh, we hoped that it would attract high flyers in their 20s and 30s who wanted to change the world and were willing to give a kind of practical commitment to, to doing so. Ambition with a conscience remains the, the byline of the network. Two years on, the presence of so many remarkable young professionals in this room tonight, I think is testament to both the, the timeliness of this initiative um, and also its clear success. The network is most ably led by Andrew Smith and the excellent steering committee uh, who are here tonight. And Andrew will speak briefly later on how the network is evolving. The UNA UK has begun to rejuvenate over the last four years to reflect the values of a new generation, a generation that rejects simplistic slogani sloganizing, a generation which doesn't feel that idealism and realism are incompatible approaches, and a generation that values practical actions that actually uh, increase the life chances of others rather than political dogma. And it's also most fitting for YPN to be hosted here at the FCO because in our new foreign secretary, in David Miliband, we have somebody who's leading a transformation in this office to build as a priority the importance of effective international institutions. And David, we're really grateful to you, both because you have a genuine uh, understanding and a clear personal commitment to a strong, credible, and effective United Nations. I will now hand over to Paul Johnston, who comes to his new position fresh from New York um, and comes with an extensive personal knowledge of the workings of the Security Council. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, there will be only uh, a few words, uh, I promise. The Foreign Secretary just said to me that um, I'm almost young enough to be in this group. And in fact, um, I understand that the, the age range is 20 to 39, is that right? So in fact, this is my last few months of being eligible for the, the group. So <laughs> I fear we will need to host a reception next year if I'm to be uh, invited again. But it's tremendously, I would say, inspiring to see so many young people uh, from the professions, from a whole range of professions, who are interested in the work of the United Nations. Um, I started my job here last week and one of the first things I did was go to our leadership conference where we had a speech from the Foreign Secretary about the importance of the UN, both as an institution in itself and as an instrument for delivering our international priorities. And generally for our diplomacy, the importance of networks, networks of governments, but networks uh, like these as well. So it's fantastic to have so many young professionals here. If I may say so, it's fantastic to have one quite not so young professional, Lord Haney, who's always been one of my heroes throughout my career. He was uh, our ambassador to the United Nations when I started off in the Foreign Office. And uh, it's uh, tremendous to have the institution that he leads um, so well led by him. But to have all of you here is fantastic. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you in the Foreign Office. And it's a great pleasure to have the Foreign Secretary to speak to you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the UN well, a General Assembly held its first meeting down the road from here, 300 yards away in Westminster Central Hall. And I think it's therefore appropriate to have the reception here, symbolizing the long association between the UK and the UN, but also symbolizing a set of values that I think Britain, at its best, brings with other countries into the international system, values of social justice, values of the equal worth of all, values of cooperation and solidarity across barriers of region and race and religion. And I think it, it is really tremendous to see so many young, younger people disproving the simplistic adage that actually people don't care about politics, that politics can't achieve change, that people are more interested in their own lives rather than in other people's lives. And all of my experience, whether on, as a local constituency MP uh, or in the gatherings like this, I think shows that there is a strong uh, spirit of idealism and people want to put it into practice. And I just want to say three things 
tonight that I think are important uh, for foreign policy in general, that are therefore obviously important for uh, the Foreign Office, and I hope might be important. And there are three things that, I, that have become clearer and clearer to me over the last eight months. And I would say, my judgment is that there is a sort of decreasing order of obviousness. Uh, I think before I became Foreign Secretary, I knew that the old model that said foreign policy was about foreigners and home policy, domestic policy was about British citizens, I, I knew that that was breaking down. But I think it's important to understand quite how fundamentally it's broken down. If you care about the jobs of British citizens, if you care about the health and especially the sort of safety from things like avian flu of British citizens, if you care about the impact of climate change on British citizens, if you care about the security of British citizens, you've got to be interested in foreign policy. And that's why the Prime Minister says that over there is now over here. And I think that it's important, especially for an institution like this, which can have, sorry to say this, uh, Paul, but the, the Foreign Office can be quite a forbidding institution. It stands on King's Charles Street, and it can seem like a forbidding institution. I think it's important that we recognize that in the end, foreign policy comes back home. And we don't just see the benefits of our foreign policy in safer streets, uh, in far-flung parts of the world, or democratic governance in far-flung parts of the world, or development in far-flung parts of the world, or even peace in far-flung parts of the world. We actually see it in our own streets. So that's just the first thing I'd like to put to you, is that what you're doing in voicing and in engaging your support for the UN is you're actually making a contribution to your own country, or to the country that you live in, not all of you are British citizens, uh, as well as to uh, wider ideals. Second point, that I think is increasingly evident um, is not just the obvious point that the world of 1945 is different from the world of 2008. I think far more challenging is that the balance of power politics that the UN was set up to overcome is actually being overcome not by the UN, unfortunately, uh, but being overcome by a different sort of politics, a politics of what I call uh, shared uh, interest as opposed to natural, national interest. The old balance of power politics said that my security or the security of my country, or the safety of my country, or the prosperity of my country came at the expense of the prosperity or security of your country. Now, in significant parts of international affairs, that balance of power politics remains. But what I think is really interesting is that actually the rise of a politics of shared interest is challenging that notion that my nat national interest depends on yours uh, going away, on yours being reduced. And it was interesting that when I, I was in China two weeks ago talking to the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, the notion that came through again and again was that they, they believed we are moving beyond an era of zero-sum politics, which I think is interesting. I mean, in foreign policy as, as in domestic policy, you've always got to ask yourself, why are people saying that? Do they really believe it? What, are the, what, is it, what, what does it mean? But I think that it does speak profoundly to the economic, social, and political challenges of the modern world. We've got a debate in this country, just to take the Chinese example, about uh, protectionism in in Europe. The Chinese wanted to make the argument to me that the growth of their markets was actually good for European citizens and European consumers, not bad for them. Uh, I agreed with them. I think it's good. I tried to make the argument to them that their sovereign wealth fund was welcome in London, but that London was an open uh, part of the global economy, one of the most open parts of the global economy, that worked according to clear rules, and it had made its, maintained its strength by adhering to those rules. So there was a deal at the heart of it. And I think that notion of a politics of shared interest is not wishy-washy, actually. It's very, very hard-headed in the modern uh, world. The third uh, point is, is, I think, only just being developed, and I, I'm at an early stage of trying to understand this, but I think it speaks directly to what you're doing by joining uh, the, the UN group. If you want to achieve change in the modern world, you need governments. And that's what the UN was set up to represent. Treaties were negotiated. Governments represent that. However, if you've only got government on your side, you're not going to get change. If you care about any of the issues that I've raised, you need two other things. First of all, you need the drive and the innovation of the private sector. You need markets that work in the public interest. But you also need citizens mobilized in a big way to campaign for and deliver change. If you care about terrorism or climate change or development or good government, 
those things aren't going to be delivered just by governments negotiating treaties, however great it is and important it is uh, to do so. This movement of uh, citizens, uh, of change driven by citizens, I think is very, very profound. I call it the civilian surge. And civilian surge rather than, the idea came to me when I was talking to David Petraeus in uh, Baghdad, because he was talking about the military surge, but um, he, he, he said very plainly in a, in a, to, to a group of uh, photographers and uh, media people, he said, you can't kill your way out of the problems that Iraq has. In other words, you need a civilian surge as well as a military surge. And what is the civilian surge? The civilian surge is monks on the streets of Rangoon protesting against the government in Burma and its restrictions uh, on them. The civilian surge is people in Kenya demanding a parliamentary democracy that actually works. And the civilian surge, to some extent, is a more educated, more informed, more literate uh, population, more conscious of its rights in the developing world, wanting to assert its own role in delivering change. And so I would uh, say to you that you should take real strength, and I take strength from the fact that so many of you have decided to come together and support the ideals of uh, the UN, and also that you're actually trying to make a practical difference. It's one thing to say, join an organization because you believe in its values, which is a good thing uh, to do, all sorts of uh, us join organizations for that. But actually to say to people, join an organization to deliver some change. And I think the projects that you're doing in respect of uh, preventing conflict, uh, the work that you're doing, I think, is it on um, corporate social responsibility and the role of business. I think those are ways of engaging not just the, um, uh, the heads of people, but the hearts of people uh, as well. So I'd like to thank you for what you're doing. I'd like to thank you for coming tonight. And I'd like you to commit yourself to staying engaged and involved, not just in the work of the UN, but in the work of building a world of shared interest that recognizes uh, shared interests and uh, takes them forward in a way that recognizes that in the end, there's one planet and we either share it well or we share it badly. If we share it well, we all gain. If we share it badly, we all lose. Thank you very much indeed. Um, on behalf of everyone here and the entire Young Professionals Network, I'd really like to thank uh, the Foreign Secretary and Paul Johnson, um, not just for your words just now or for supporting this event, but for being such consistent, strong supporters of the UN system and UN values. So we're here tonight uh, to launch the 2008-2009 programme of the Young Professionals Network. Uh, this has three uh, core areas. One is a programme called Working for Peace. Secondly, a programme around business for the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, thirdly, the United Nations and law. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. If you do nothing else, please introduce yourself to some people you haven't met before here. Um, if you like what you see growing here in the Young Professionals Network, please invite colleagues, friends, other people you think might be interested in this to join the mailing list. Um, and I very much look forward to meeting many of you this evening and at our future events going forward in the coming year. Thank you very much.